Comanche warriors were some of the fiercest people across the plains in part of what is now New Mexico. After the abandonment of Mesa Verde, a significant population of Pueblo Anasazi people moved farther east, where they eventually established trade networks with Comanche and other plains groups. This pre-European contact has provided significant evidence that Comanche people inhabited the American Plains during prehistory around 1450 or possibly even much earlier. Often our modern culture does not tell the full story behind raids and battles in and around the Great Plains. Simply put, Comanche warriors were an absolute force to be reckoned with and when provoked to fight against settlers, neighboring tribes, and the American cavalry, Comanche fighters caused utter chaos. Victims of raids were brutalized and tortured. Tactics including the removal of fingers, scalping, and placing burning hot coals on a person's chest were used to strike fear into the enemy and eventually force them to either conform or give up. It is said a Comanche warrior was able to send off multiple arrows into a victim's body before the opponent was even able to pull the trigger on their firearm. Although rifles were introduced to Comanche warriors, the bow and arrow system was still heavily relied upon and used. Bows were constructed from Osage Orange and often very short in length. Based on historical examples, the Comanche bow varied in shape but kept a regionally specific design through time and space. As we analyze historic patterns, we can definitively say the Comanche bow carried enough power to kill a high volume of people and animals. Years ago, I began my search by using experimental archaeological practices and methods in searching for the best style and shape of bow, not only for this localized environment, but other environments throughout North and South America. I first started by crafting long bows, and as time went by, those bows started drastically reducing in size, not much longer than a yardstick. Simply put, the short bow is absolutely the best performing in the American Southwest and throughout North America. I would argue even throughout South America. If we think about it in a more practical sense, they're much faster and they carry a bit more energy compared to the longer, more sluggish bow. Now this isn't to say that there's anything wrong with the longbow. The longbow definitely has its place in certain bioregions throughout the global sphere. But if we analyze certain climatic and environmental conditions and changes throughout the global sphere, we notice the pattern of commonality that animals are becoming much smarter, resilient, and faster. So we must accommodate as well, and that's where the shortbow comes in handy. In this video, I want to take you step by step in crafting a short OC Sage orange bow. We'll first analyze the growth rings on the stave and then we'll start establishing the back of the bow. Let's get started. Well, what you're looking at right now is the cut end of an Osage orange stave right below the sapwood into the heartwood of the stave. From the top into the core, you can see the different layers of Osage orange. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to establish a single growth ring from tip to tip on the back of this bow or the back of this stave right now. And what that's essentially doing is it's providing more strength and a much less probability of the bow breaking as I pull the string back and ready to launch the arrow. So by establishing a single growth ring from tip to tip, you're increasing the chances of your bow surviving and not breaking throughout the tillering process or many, many years after. And that's really important with most staves and most woods. There's a few exceptions where you can get away with minor violations within the growth ring, such as yew wood and hickory. But woods like Osage Orange, uh, mulberry, hackberry, New Mexican locust, honey locust, black locust, you want to make sure that you're carefully removing the layers of wood and chasing a single growth ring from tip to tip. Now you can see that there's a late wood ring, this amber colored ring, and then an early wood ring, and that is the yellowish orange color. And they alternate back and forth from the top all the way to the core of the stave. So once again, we have the amber color, then we have the yellow color. Amber color, yellow color from top to bottom. Now I'm establishing 
The amber colored ring or the late wood ring is providing the most strength on the back of the stave. So I'm going to pick out a nice wide ring and chase that late wood ring from tip to tip and that becomes the back of the stave. Now my friend and mentor Mark Swanson brought up a good analogy when chasing a single ring on the back of the stave. And that's to think of it as a strand of spaghetti. And you have to be careful even when establishing a single growth ring on the back of the stave or the back of your bow. So when you take a strand of spaghetti and you stretch that noodle out, let's say someone takes a razor blade and starts cutting at the center of that strand, what ends up happening is it breaks, it rips apart. The same thing can happen even within an established single growth ring on the back of a bow. If you nick it, you gouge it, eventually that ring will break down and you increase the probability and the chances of breaking the bow in future years or future months to come. So even within, the moral of the story is, even within the late wood ring that you decide to chase, work slow, work carefully, use fine grit sandpaper and various tools. So now we will get to work. Here you can see the layers of Osage Orange. I have the early wood that's kind of splotchy. You'll feel it crunch when you work it. And in between the early wood are splotches of late wood. And this is the ring that I'm chasing. This late wood ring and all of this early wood gets removed. Here I have a single growth ring chased on the back of the stave. So this is the back of the bow. And you can see that nice wide growth ring. At this point, I'll move forward and we'll start removing belly wood from this stave and then we can start creating our measurements. Okay, so I want to take you through the measurement system that I like to use for Osage Orange. Now keep in mind, as discussed before, every stave is different and unique. So this measurement system might vary with each individual stave. The bow dictates what design you use or the stave dictates what design you use. As you can see here, I have a knot that I swelled around. So this is a little bit different. We definitely have some character to this bow, which we have to accommodate with these three knots. Another thing that I'm looking at is on the side of this stave, I have vertical cracking up and down, almost from tip to tip. So it ends about right here. And that's because this stave dried way too fast for this dry desert environment. It's very difficult to cut fresh wood and not have splitting occur in the mountainous regions. It's definitely dry out here. So if I do have to alter this measurement system, that's fine. I just work with what I have. So what I do is I take the entire length of this stave, which is 42.25 inches long, and I find the halfway mark. So I divide that in half and I create a horizontal center mark. That becomes the center of the stave or the center of the bow. Off of that center line, I find two inches on one side on the left side and then two inches on the other side on the right side. That becomes my handle area, so a four inch handle. Then by eyeballing, I find the center of the stave and I just create a vertical mark all the way up from tip to tip. From that vertical mark, every two inches, I make a horizontal line on both sides of both limbs. From the horizontal marks, I find off of the center line an inch and a quarter. So that's the total width. And I like an inch and a quarter. That's a really good measurement system for Osage Orange. So an inch and a quarter, I make lines once again, every two inches on both limbs up to five inches. So five inches is where my tips begin to pinch in. So from the tips, I find that center line, once again, as you can see here, and on both sides, I measure out a quarter inch. So a quarter inch on the right side and a quarter inch on the left side. Same thing with this upper limb or the limb that's facing closest to the camera. A quarter inch on one side, on the right side, and then a quarter inch on the opposite side. 
I simply connect those lines together right up to that inch and a quarter, which is just a vertical measurement as you can see here. And for where that inch and a quarter ends at five inches, the tips begin to pinch in to that half inch mark. So I have a half inch right at the tip of this bow. So then the last thing is simply connecting the marks together for the handle. I like an inch wide on the handle. I like a little bit of bend to it. Again, with these shorter bows, you want the entire bow to bend to take stress off of a specific area. So I find an inch wide and I just pinch in that handle and slightly curve into that inch and a quarter mark on both limbs. Very simplistic, easy measurement system. And once again, you can see I have that swelled around this knot. I might end up losing this once again. So these measurements are just a basic guide in what I'm looking for, but of course we might have to alter them with the cracking on the side and the knot. We'll just have to see where this build takes us. So I have this bow cut to shape, as you can see. We have our measurements followed. And I've also been removing a lot of wood on this belly side to get through this crack. This crack was actually much worse than I thought. I thought it was running nice and clean through the rings. Instead, I'm finding it's pitched at a little bit of an angle. So I'm hoping it doesn't cause issues. It is starting to bend a bit in the handle. So I need to balance that out by removing a lot of belly wood. So transitioning into a rasp is where I'm at at this point. So I'll remove equal amounts of wood on the limbs and I'll stay away from the handle now that it does look like I went through that crack and it has now officially disappeared, which is good. But I want to leave this handle alone. Again, it's bending. It's definitely bending. And I don't want it to create further issues. So I'll just start removing equal amounts of wood. It's now time to take the twist out of this bow and you can see where the twist is at. So from this line to the tip is quite twisted. And I take the twist out with a wrench and a soft cloth so I don't damage the back ring. I heat the wood with a heat gun, get it nice and hot to where I can feel the back is quite warm. And then I start slowly pulling it out. And Osage Orange is nice to work with because once this wood is hot, it bends like rubber. It's very, very forgiving. Well, I'm now on my sixth day of working with this bow and everything's starting to come together really nice. I have both limbs bouncing quite evenly on the floor. So I have it floor tillered. And then you can see I also pulled that twist out of this bow. So everything's nice and straight. I did end up using that dry heat to induce a little bit of reflex in the limbs. And in turn, that stiffened up the handle. So this handle is just flexing a little bit. It's right where I want it to be. So at this point, I really need to slow down and I'm going to transition into a scraper, in this case, a sharp knife blade. And I'm removing equal amounts of wood on both of these limbs and transitioning into this handle. So I want to continue this process in wood removal until I can get a string on this bow. Once I get this strung up, I can see what parts are stiff and what parts are bending too much. So this is where we really work slow 
and we just take off equal amounts of wood and I'll start that process right now. Okay, so here's the bow at a low brace height. This string is still stretching just a tad bit more. And what I'm seeing is really not a bad tiller for just a floor tiller. It's not bad at all. This limb is definitely bending more. So right in here, it's bending more than this area. This area is just a tad bit flat. And this lower limb, I'm seeing more bend outside of the fade and then we have a flat spot from the fade into the tip. So those are the areas that I'll focus on in balancing this out. But it's not too bad, it's still a bit heavy, which I definitely need to remove more mass. This bow is starting to really look good. I'm liking what I'm seeing. And I've transitioned from using a scraper into a slower process of using sandpaper. I want to start really slowing down the work and remove even smaller amounts of wood until I hit my final tiller and draw weight that's desired. Right now I'm 40 pounds at 15 inches of draw, hopefully at 18, 19 inches. I can get 45, 50 pounds. We'll see what that ends up being. But right now what I'm seeing is I'm seeing this limb is bending beautifully. It looks really good, but this bottom limb is just a tad bit stiff and there's slight asymmetry going on here. And when I run my hand across the surface of both limbs in the same spot, I feel that this bottom limb is a bit thicker right in here from the fade into the center limb, of course, of the lower limb. And when examining the growth ring, this growth ring does dip down a bit lower. So I'll end up working this spot until it starts coming around. And then hopefully we can start shooting it in here just shortly. So I'll continue this process of sanding slow and equal amounts of wood until we can go down to the target range and send a few arrows through it. At 18 inches, I'm 49 pounds. At 19, I'll probably hit 51 pounds. Boy, that's not bad for such a short design. This thing's going to be very fast. The final steps in making the Osage Orange short bow is to add decorations by waxing the handle and wrapping it with red wool trade cloth and a thin strip of brain tan leather. Once completed, a heavy application of bear fat is applied as a surface treatment. The end result is a beautifully decorated bow worthy of hunting large games such as elk and deer with. 